The Cold War is history. But Russia is in the grips of another arms race. No warheads are involved. The enemy is a microbe. And the battleground is the human body. The race between predator and prey is a driving force in evolution. But this too is a predator. And we are its prey. Russia's crowded prisons have spawned the evolution of a deadly new microbe, resistant to our best medicine. As it escapes prison walls, it attacks new prey without preference, without warning. Like any medical student, I knew about the disease. I knew its symptoms. But I had no idea it could be like this. Now the killer is spreading beyond Russia, and everyone is fair game. The arms race between humans and microbes cannot be won by drugs alone. But if we learn to harness evolution, we may reach a truce with our mortal enemies. On a misty morning, western Oregon seems a mild place, fit for gentle creatures like beaver and duck. Yet this is home to one of the deadliest animals on Earth. Local legend long hinted at its lethal power. Eventually, a tale of untimely so death three, attracted the scrutiny them. of science. When I was an undergraduate student 37 years ago, my professor told me a story about three hunters out here in the coast range being found dead, and there was a newt boiled in their coffee pot. So his question to me was, go find out if these newts are poisonous. Edmund Brody Jr. has studied the rough-skinned newt ever since. The last decade or so with his son, Edmund Brody III. It turns out the newt is extremely poisonous. Its skin glands secrete one of the most potent toxins found in nature. When ingested, the toxin can paralyze a victim within minutes and shut down vital functions within hours. An amount equivalent to a pinhead can kill an adult human. This is probably the most poisonous animal in the world with enough skin toxin to kill tens of thousands of mice or perhaps a hundred people. Of course, they don't bite, so this isn't really dangerous holding it unless I were to eat it, uh, which I won't. The question was, why should a small animal like this be so many times more toxic than necessary to kill all predators? Why should a salamander evolve that much toxin? Yeah, I can smell the, the secretion. Don't lick your hands. <laughs> I'll try not to. Thank you.
No environmental factor can explain the evolution of the newt's extreme toxicity. The Brodies discovered another animal is responsible. I'm going to head over to these brambles. OK. The common garter snake thrives in these parts. Harmless to humans, it feeds on earthworms, frogs, and toads. But there's one prey in the snake's diet a few other predators ever touch. She's got a food item. Oh, yeah. Look at that. It's a pretty big object. I don't know if it's, a, if it's big enough to be a newt, but it could be. Come on, honey. Here it comes. Uh, yeah, here it is. Hey, uh -huh. <laughs> how about that? It had eaten a full-sized male newt. Yeah. This species of garter snake is the, the predator that we think is driving the evolution of the high toxin levels in the newts. This is the only thing that can survive an encounter with a newt. It's the only thing that can, therefore, represent a selective pressure for increasing toxicity. As the snakes get better at resisting the effects of the toxin, the prey has to evolve higher levels of toxin. You can think of this as this sort of escalating, counter-escalating arms race between the predator and the newt, the prey. But the toxin does take a toll. Some snakes are slowed down. Others are immobilized for a few hours after eating a newt. In the lab, the Brodies can measure the garter snake's resistance to the toxin. They coax a baby snake down a track wired with motion sensors and record its time. Time. Three, four. Then they inject the snake with a small amount of purified toxin to simulate the effects of eating a newt. Now the snake is raced again. It's aggressive. Sometimes when they can't crawl, they do that. A snake with low resistance can be stalled to a standstill. 6.3. Yeah. Whoa. A resistant snake is much less affected by the toxin, but it too pays a price. The more resistant a snake, the more slowly it moves without any toxin. The snake experiences a cost from evolving the resistance. That snake would be more susceptible to its own predators. So there's a trade-off between speed in a snake and the level of resistance. All through Oregon, you've got We were very surprised to see that the arms race is a predator evolving to a prey and a prey evolving to the predator. And this has allowed us to get a better understanding of evolution. It's now abundantly clear that uh, evolution is driven not just by physical forces, such as storms and fire and climatic change, but much more by biological forces. That is, particularly the way species interact with one another, cooperating with one another, parasitizing one another, preying on one another. What made the lion fierce and the zebra fast? What sparked the development of tooth and claw? The deadly dance of predator and prey drives evolution.
Surely there was a time on an ancient savanna when hungry beasts hunted our ancestors. Perhaps the hot breath of carnivores once drove our own evolution and made us faster, stronger, or smarter. But today, we have only one kind of predator left to fear. Microorganisms that cause disease consume us from the inside out. The human body is the food that fuels their rapid fire reproduction. Some bacteria can reproduce a million times more quickly than we do. These microscopic predators have cast a long, dark shadow on our history. The bacteria that caused tuberculosis riddled the bodies of Egyptian nobles over 4,000 years ago. Another microbe spawned the dreaded Black Death. In the 14th century, bubonic plague killed one in three Europeans. The influenza virus claimed some 20 million lives on the heels of World War I. We were virtually defenseless against infectious disease until recently. This is a battlefield, a battlefield in man's total war against disease. Here, man has locked his heaviest artillery against premature death, antibiotics, the miracle drugs of our time. In the 20th century, scientists began to focus on the chemicals that microbes produce to attack each other. Perhaps some of these compounds would kill disease organisms without harming the human body. The first so-called antibiotic, penicillin, saved countless lives in World War II. Now doctors had a weapon to fight the infections that commonly killed soldiers wounded on the battlefield. By the 1950s, hundreds of antibiotics were on the market. Defeating deadly germs seemed like child's play. In 1969, the U.S. Surgeon General declared it was time to close the book on infectious disease. He spoke too soon. The Russian prison system is ground zero of a new epidemic. An old killer is back with a vengeance. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia's incarceration rate has soared to the highest in the world. More than one million inmates are confined to a penal system designed for a fraction of that number. But overcrowding, poor nutrition, and scant sanitation are not the worst of a prisoner's nightmares. Now, tuberculosis stalks these men. The bacteria that cause TB can lie dormant for decades in a healthy person. But if the immune system is weakened, the microbes begin to multiply and consume the lungs. Prisoners are malnourished. Many of them are alcoholics. Many of them are smokers. And just the stress of being in prison, all these factors together make you very, very susceptible to probably not only being infected with TB, but also coming down with active disease. When a person with active TB coughs, or even speaks, he expels contagious droplets that linger in the air for hours. The next victim needs only to inhale to be infected. At least 100,000 inmates have active TB, but antibiotics are in short supply. Many men will die before their terms are up. Sasha Biljevic 